Hi, everyone. Uh, today we are talking about the rotational kinetic energy, whereas we had um, traditional kinetic energy uh, in our, uh, not last unit, it was like two chapters ago. So first, uh, does a spinning wheel have kinetic energy, right? So a spinning wheel, it's not going anywhere, right? But it is moving. So yes, a spinning wheel does have kinetic energy. It's just not the kinetic energy that we usually thought of. So why would the tried and true one half mv squared be problematic? Well, if we look at the idea that we've got one half mv squared, right? Velocity on a rotating object is not true for the entire object, right? The velocity at this point here is different than the velocity at this point here or here or here. So what velocity would you use? If you use one half mv squared, you're kind of getting the kinetic energy at that point on the wheel, right? Now you can make the assumption that the kinetic energy on the furthest out point would be the, the kinetic energy of the entire wheel. However, uh, we want to use omega. Omega is true for the entire wheel, so we should just get an equation that uses omega and then everything will work out nice and nice and pretty. So let's do that. Letter C asks to derive an equation for the rotational kinetic energy. So we will start with K equals one half mv squared. Okay. And what we'll do is we will use uh, V equals omega R to make a substitution. Now we will say that one half M times omega R squared, that's legal, right? That is our uh, kinetic energy. Now if we distribute that square and rearrange it, right? Now we have one half M R squared omega squared, right? We're just rearranging. Now we see that there is one more substitution we can make. If you know that I is the summation of mass times radius squared, then we can see that here we've got an MR squared. So that means we can make one last substitution to reach rotational kinetic energy. Okay? And really, when we look at this, this is just that angular velocity substituting for, velo for linear velocity and angular mass substituting for uh, traditional mass, right? We, we've been saying that the uh, moment of inertia is kind of like angular mass uh, when we start talking about rotational objects, right? So we are going to get some practice using this equation. Now we've used this setup before when we were talking about moment of inertia. Now we're going to find its rotational kinetic energy if it's rotating at two radians per second using both kinetic energy equations. Now first it asks, should we use our old kinetic equation or a new kinetic equation? We're gonna use both just to show um, that you can do it either way. And would you get the same answer either way? We're gonna find out. So let's start with K equals one half I omega squared, okay? First we need I, okay? I is going to be the summation of our masses in radii squared. So that would be uh, four times three squared is nine, plus two times negative two squared is four, plus three times negative four squared is 16. Okay, so that moment of inertia, we're going to call 92. Okay, that is uh, 92, uh, didn't leave myself enough room. 92 kilogram meters squared. So now that we have that, uh, we're going to just put that in. That, that's, that's really all we've got to it. So our rotational kinetic energy is one half times 92 times, what is it, two, two squared? Yeah, so you've got two, square it, you've got 184, 184 joules. That's pretty straightforward. Find the I, the omega was given to us, plug and chug. Now, doing the other way is possible. Okay, we're gonna call this tangential kinetic energy for this scenario, uh, and we will use one half mv tangential squared. Okay? Now, there are two different ways that you can do this. I'll show you the way to basically arrive uh, at omega, okay? 
uh, we have, oh, sorry, we're, yeah, we're going to arrive back at rotational. So we take KT equals one half M, but we're going to say V is omega R and square that, right? So now we have KT equals one half M omega squared R squared. And we will make one more rearrangement. Okay, now we're going to say that this is m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared, right? So the uh, angular velocity, that's going to be the same for everyone. But the mass and radius change for everyone. So this really just turns out to be one half omega squared, and we just made moment of inertia, right? So we just arrived at our old equation, so we can see that that's going to be the same. However, you could also uh, find the velocity for each, uh, each mass. So you can say that this is um, mass 1 times the omega times radius 1 squared, plus mass 2 times omega times the radius for 2 squared plus mass three times omega times the radius for three squared, right? They all have different radii. They all have different masses. So they all have a different uh, tangential velocity. So this will all also work as well. It all comes out to 184 joules, uh, no matter which method you use, right? Now, obviously this one took us the least amount of time. So I would recommend doing that one. However, you're, you can still get the right answer using other methods. There is always more than one way to solve a physics problem. So um, I would say use your new kinetic energy equation, but you can use the old one. And yes, you get the same answer either way. It's just which one works for you and which one is fastest. Now, the kinetic energy of a molecule. Uh, a diatomic molecule of oxygen rotates in the xy plane about the z-axis through its center. Um, the mass of each oxygen atom is 2.55 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms, and the average separation between the two oxygen atoms is 121 picometers. Now we're going to treat the atoms as point masses. Um, first, it wants us to calculate the moment of inertia about the z-axis, and then if the angular speed of the molecule is 4.6 times 10 to the 12th radians per second, calculate its rotational kinetic energy. So first, let's draw our picture. Okay, we've got an oxygen atom here, oxygen atom here, looks kind of like lifting weights, right? So you've got 121 picometers, you've got the mass of oxygen on each side. Now, it's going to pivot about its center of mass, right? Because they are equal in mass, uh, you can just cut that in two. So as they are rotating, they're rotating about the z-axis, right? They rotate it in the xy plane about the z-axis. Now let's get our givens. Our givens, let's see, mass of oxygen is 2.55 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. Uh, then we know that the uh, diameter between them, distance between them, is 121 picometers. We also know that um, that's 121 times 10 to the negative 12. Okay, pico is 10 to the negative 12 meters. Now, calculate the moment of inertia. So what we'll do is we take uh, summation of mass times the radii squared, right? but they have the same mass, they actually have the same radius, right? So we could actually just do two times the mass of oxygen times the radius squared. That radius we actually have in terms of diameter, so we'll do diameter over two squared, right? So when we do that, we have two times 2.55 times 10 to the negative 26 times 121 times 10 to the negative 12 divided by 2 squared. Okay. Put that in our calculator. We will get 187, sorry, 1.87 times 10 to the negative 46 kilogram meters squared. 
So that is a ridiculously small number. And, and that's, that is the right answer, right? We didn't make any errors on that one. Um, that is the moment of inertia of an oxygen molecule, right? A diatomic molecule means you've got two atoms bonded together, di meaning two, atomic meaning atoms. So uh, that is a very small number, but you also got to keep in mind, this is kilogram meters squared, and we're looking at a molecule that is usually measured in atomic mass units, and its distance is usually measured in picometers, not meters. So this is going to be a very different number than uh, what would be accurate to its scale. So not unusual, right? So that was the moment of inertia for the molecule. Check. Now for part B, if the angular speed of the molecule is 4.6 times 10 to the 12th radians per second, calculate its rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so now we have a new given, right? We've got omega is 4.6 times 10 to the 12th. Now, uh, if we want the rotational kinetic energy, you'll just take one half I omega squared. So we've already got, you know what one half is, right? I was 1.87 times 10 to the negative 46. And then we'll take our omega 4.6 times 10 to the 12th. We're gonna square that. Put that all in your calculator and we get a, not quite a small number, but a still small number. I got 1.99 times 10 to the negative 21 joules. Also, really small amount of energy, but it's, it's a single molecule, right? So we can't expect a whole lot of energy coming out of a spinning molecule. Now, one thing that I do like doing on this problem is putting this in terms of what an atom is usually measured in. So an atom is usually measured in atomic mass units. So atomic mass units, let me get my conversion. One second. In our textbook that we use for this class, uh, we've got 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms per one atomic mass unit, right? And we already know the picometer to meter conversion, right? So uh, how many atomic mass units is that for our oxygen? I actually don't remember what the AM uses for oxygen, so let's find out. Mass of oxygen is 2.55 times 10 to the negative 26, that's kilograms. I should zoom in, I'm just scribbling away over here. Sorry about that, that doesn't look good. Times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms over one times, what was that? 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms for one AMU. Okay. Cancel out our kilograms. We're going to get mass in AMU. So let's figure out what that is. That's 15.36 AMUs. Okay. That's probably supposed to be either 15 or 16. I can't remember. I don't, I don't, I'm not a chemistry teacher. I can't remember the periodic table that well. So we've got 15.36 AMUs as our approximate uh, mass for these oxygen atoms. Uh, and then we already have the uh, distance between them in picometers. So this is a, it's a, that sounds like a pretty big atom if we're talking AMUs. So let's take our 1.87 times 10 to the negative 46. Okay, that's kilogram meters squared. And we're going to, multiply, we're actually going to divide that, okay, by 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms for one AMU. So here I'm going to be making up units because an AMU square picometer is not a thing, but we know that, uh, whoops, 10 to the negative 12 meters is one picometer, but those meters are squared. So we need to square that number. So let me put that in my calculator and see what I get. Okay. 
Okay, so if I put that in my calculator, I'm getting something along the lines of 113,000. AMU picometers squared. So on the scale of atoms, when we're talking picometers and AMUs, that's a lot of moment of inertia, right? So that's gonna take a lot of energy relative to their size to actually uh, make it rotate, right? Uh, that's kind of what moment of inertia is, right? Moment of inertia is more like the resistance to generate acceler uh, angular acceleration with torque, right? So that's, that's a pretty good size. Not the AMU uh, square picometers is a real unit, uh, I just wanted to see what uh, what those numbers kind of look like on that atomic scale. All right, that's what we have for rotational kinetic energy, and we will uh, begin uh, wrapping up Chapter 10 in our next couple of videos.